Thank you very much, Alina. Thank you for the introduction and, and thanks for inviting me to this uh, wonderful uh, webinar. And <laughs> I apologize for the typo in the year. We're we're still in 22. Thanks, uh, Mike, for spotting. Hopefully, it's the last typo in the in the talk. And so today, I would like to talk about a, a, a recent new uh, phenomenon discovered by uh, Peter Sauna called optimal sum approximation, and a, a way to prove it. Uh, using the sound of free density hypothesis. Um, the optimal sum approximation uh, result is uh, it's, it's a new type of result which sits in a natural progression of results starting from strong approximation, passing through super strong approximation, uh, which I would like to tell you about. Uh, these are results about arithmetic groups. And I thought I'll start with uh, perhaps the prototypical example of an arithmetic group, SL2Z. And so SL2Z, I'm thinking about it as a group scheme over the integers. That means that for any ring, uh, commutative with unity, uh, I can assign the group SL2R, the, the group of two by two matrices with coefficients in R, whose determinant is one. And for example, if R is the ring of integers, then I get the arithmetic group SL2Z. If R is the ring of integers modulo Q for some integer Q, we get the finite group SL2 Z mod Q. And there is a natural map going from the arithmetic group SL2 Z to SL2 Z mod Q, which is the taking modulo Q uh, in each coefficient. And the natural question is whether this map is onto, and it is a, it's a classical result. And it's a special case of the the phenomenon called strong approximation, which says that this is in fact onto. Uh, honestly, I don't know who to attribute this result. Uh, I'll be happy to hear if there's an expert in the audience who can tell me who was the right person, the first person to actually discover it. Uh, but the proof is, is very elementary, uh, very nice. It uses the Chinese remainder theorem to reduce to the case where Q is a prime power. And then you just use Gauss elimination to show that any matrix in answer to Z mod Q, you can write it as a product of elementary matrices. And those one you can lift to answer to Z. And um, let me uh, try to reinterpret this strong approximation result uh, in a more geometric graph theoretical form. And to do that, I, I, I need to recall the notion of the construction of Cayley graphs. So let's fix uh, once and for all a finite symmetric generating set of the arithmetic group. And then for any integers, I can I denote the finite group GQ to be SL2 Z mod Q, uh, the finite subset of it SQ to be the image of the generating set of the arithmetic group modulo Q. And to this pair, I, I assign the Cayley graph. That's the graph whose vertices are the elements of the finite group. And I adjoin to each vertex G, vertices of the form G times S for any S in the finite set SQ. And it's easy to observe that the, the, the graph XQ is connected precisely when the modulo Q map is surjective, and therefore we have an equivalence reformulation uh, of the strong approximation result as the fact that all of these graphs are connected. So this is the first property. And next, I want to uh, uh, tell you about uh, a, prop, a, a notion coming from theoretical computer science and graph theory which is a strengthening of the notion of being connected. So a graph is either connected or uh, not, but the uh, computer scientists are also interested in graphs which are highly connected. Uh, these are called expander graphs and they are measured using this Schiller constant. So what is an expander graph? Essentially, it's a graph that in any way that you try to separate it into two sets, A and the complement of A, uh, you have to uh, remove a lot of edges in doing so, you know, if you want to separate it. And a, a non, a, an example of a non-expander is, of course, you take the 
two complete large graphs and you connect the, these two clicks by an edge. This is a connected graph, but it is poorly connected. And now with this new notion of uh, highly connected graphs, these expanded graphs, one can uh, state the stronger property, which is uh, the literature is called super strong approximation. It's the property that the Cayley graphs are not only connected, but they form a family of expanded graphs. So this is, uh, this is in fact a, a theorem and, and it was, you can prove it in two ways. The first proof uh, uses actually the, uh, the famous uh, Selberg 316 theorem in which he showed the spectral gap for the Laplacian acting on uh, Riemannian surfaces, which are the upper half plane divided by certain congruent subgroups. And it's not surprising that the Cayley graphs are in some sense closely related to these Riemannian surfaces. And so Selberg's 316 theorem could be used to prove a spectral gap for these Cayley graphs. And these, this spectral gap is in fact equivalent to the notion of expansion. So this is the first proof to, uh, of this result. There is now a second proof, which is more elementary and it goes under the name of the bougain gambert expansion machinery. Uh, I'll get back to this result in a second. Um, so we have this fact that the Cayley graphs are expanders and uh, I don't want to, uh, to survey the, the notion of expanders. I, it, to those of you who've never heard about expanders, let me just say that uh, they've been intensively studied. Uh, they, are, they have remarkable applications in computer science and also in pure mathematics. And the reason why they have the, these uh, many applications is because expanded graphs display several extremal properties, pseudo randomness, uh, excellent mixing behavior. Uh, if you want to learn more about them, there are uh, uh, award, two award winning surveys in the bulletin of the AMS about expanded graphs. Uh, and I will just want to to focus on a single property that expanded graphs display. And that property will also be important for a lifting problem, natural lifting problem one can ask for these arithmetic groups. So expanded graphs have the, as a, the extreme property of having logarithmic diameter. So the diameter of the graph is just the maximal distance between any two vertices of the graph and any regular infinite family of graphs their diameter cannot go below log the size of the graph. Uh, and the expanders are actually, you can show that their, their diameter is bounded by some constant depending on the expansion times the log the size of the graph. So they're, they're excellent. They have the logarithmic diameter in this sense. Let me also note that the diameter, you can actually interpret it as a, as a property or it's a bound on a, a natural lifting problem. So first things first, because the graphs are symmetric, the diameter, the, the maximal distance between any two vertices of the graph is the same as the maximal distance between any vertex and the origin in the graph, right? And now you can reinterpret the, the diameter as saying that you take the maximum over all the elements in the finite group and then you minimize the word length of any element in the lift of that uh, finite element G. So this is, a, this is a, a bound on the lifting problem in terms of the word metric. And this is, brings us uh, right to the setting of uh, Sarnak's result which is an attempt to state an optimal version of the lifting problem. Um, to do that, I, would, I, I will conform to uh, uh, Sarnak's uh, notation and, uh, and uh, instead of measuring the size of elements in the arithmetic group by the word metric, which is a bit arbitrary and unnatural because it depends on the generating set. Instead, I, will, I want to measure the size of element in SL2Z by the norm. And uh, 
and in his, uh, so using this norm, I want to introduce the following almost covering exponent constant, uh, which uh, Salnak uh, described in his letter. I'm, I'm going, the, it's a nested definition. Let me start from the individual covering exponent of a specific element G and a specific parameter Q. So there is this uh, two over three constant appearing. So start from right to left. So I cannot, so. Um, you'll see why the, this, there is this normalization of two over three, but other than that, the, the individual covering exponent of G is, again, you take the minimum over all possible lift of G and you, you, what you're minimizing is over log to the base of Q of the norm. And, and then you can uh, take the mean covering exponent of the finite group of the parameter Q, just averaging over all the individual covering exponent. And finally, you take the limb soup of this uh, covering, uh, mean covering. And this is called the covering exponent. Colloquially, you can, uh, the way Stanek described it, is you can think of the set of elements uh, in SL2Z uh, of a norm bounded by some parameter T as a set of your balls and the, the set of elements the, the finite group SL2 Z mod Q is the set of boxes. The model Q map is the map sending balls to boxes. And the, this the kappa mu is the optimal constant exponent such that whenever Q square is slightly over Q to the three times this exponent, then almost every box contains a ball. Okay. And uh, okay, so now I can also explain why is, this, why is there this uh, ratio of two over three. The reason is the number of balls uh, grows like Q square and the number of boxes grows like Q to the third. That's why there's the three over three, no, two over three normalization. And clearly by a simple uh, pigeonhole principle, the, the almost covering exponent cannot, uh, cannot be smaller than one. And so the following uh, optimal results that uh, Salnak proved in his letter, I forgot to say, that, uh, what I'm describing here is a, it's a result that uh, appeared, as far as I know, for the first time in, in Salnak's uh, letter, which is available on his webpage. And, and in that letter, he, he basically showed that kappa mu is precisely one, meaning that for any large enough Q uh, and almost any element in the finite group, there is a lift of it, which is of smallest possible size. Now, uh, one can naturally ask, why did, I this, uh, why did I focus on the almost covering exponent? Why not take the covering exponent, which might seem more natural? And I guess uh, the reason is, is that I don't know much about the covering exponent, uh, but I, I, I'll devote one slide for it. And, and for the rest of the talk, you can, uh, whenever I'm talking about the all the optimal almost uh, uh, so the the optimal small approximation, you can also attach to it the question what happened for the covering exponent uh, explicitly. So for the the covering exponent is defined uh, instead of taking the mean over the individual covering exponent, you take the maximal ones, the worst one, uh, in which case uh, kappa, the covering exponent, is the smallest exponent uh, such that whenever T square goes a little over Q to the three times kappa, then every box contains a ball. And remember the super small approximation result that we've seen uh, earlier and the logarithmic diameter bound. So that bound is actually uh, gives you a, a bound on the covering exponent. So it's finite and you can bound it using the how good the, the graph are expanding, but uh, in his letter, uh, Sarnax actually proved uh, another uh, uh, remarkable result. He showed that the covering exponent is precisely four over three. And he called this the big holes phenomenon. This is similar to the badly approximated uh, element. And uh, most elements could be approximated by a lift of norm Q to the three over two, 
And this uh, result shows that for that there are some that cannot be, uh, so all elements can be approximated by lift of norm Q square, which is slightly bigger. And you can actually construct elements and infinitely many such elements such that you cannot do better uh, over, over Q square. You cannot decrease the exponent. Okay. There is also uh, this proof of the uh, Starnak uh, also comes with an efficient algorithm to find such a lift and he, and he raised the question of can you find such an, an algorithm for most uh, elements of the of the smaller exponent. Sorry, uh, Shai, there is a question. Igor, would you please unmute and ask away? Okay, thank you. Uh, the theorem says that kappa is four thirds for any q, right? Does it mean that limb soup can be replaced with just limb? A good question. No. The it's it's limb soup. What the Sarna constructed, uh, and I think it could be generalized to Q growing over a prime power of a fixed prime. He was able to construct badly approximated element, but I don't know if you take Q to run say over only the prime numbers. Can you find such badly approximated? And so the limb inf is an open question still, as far as I'm aware. Okay. But then I'm not sure I understand the theorem. It says for any large Q. Is it for infinitely many Qs? So for any large Q, you can you can find a lift uh, whose norm is bounded by Q squared. Okay. Now you cannot uh, reduce this two to one over nine for any large Q because I can find a sequence of large Q for which uh, the the only lifts uh, go bigger than Q to the power of one of 1.9. Okay, thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. No, 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 uh, uh, please interrupt. Uh, feel free to ask question. Uh, it's no problem at all. Thank you. Okay, so, so this is the, this is the, the, the the case of SL2Z. And now let's see what happened. Uh, so now let's uh, see what happens for general arithmetic groups. Um, okay, so instead of SL2C, I'm replacing it with another group scheme I'll denote it by G. And for technical reason, let's assume that it's connected, almost simple, simply connected. And I'm going to divide the, the, the groups I consider to two cases. The first case might be the more natural case is when the, the real points of the group are non-compact. And in which case the arithmetic group that I'll consider is GZ. For example, all special linear groups, uh, all split symplectic groups fall in this uh, setting. And the case two is when the real points form a compact group and but there is some for some p uh, the periodic points of the group is non-compact in which case it doesn't make sense to study small approximation for the arithmetic group gz because gz will just be a finite it's discrete and compact and its size is uh, fixed and the size of the group gz mod q grows to infinity so clearly you cannot have small approximation so you instead of the integers you take the p integer the z1 over p and that will be in case two that will be our arithmetic group an example of this case i'll say definite inner forms of uh, special unitary groups or definite inner forms of the symplectic group and it is a and, and the the strong approximation uh, property which is well understood is uh, is generalized to all of these groups and more and it says that again the modulo q maps are uh, there are natural modulo q maps and they're all surjective for any admissible q for any in case one it's any integer q and in case two any q which is co prime to p okay so the strong approximation uh, property holds in, in in higher in more general arithmetic groups what about the super strong approximation well we can Again, we can do the same kind of construction that we've seen before. But when, the second you fix some symmetric generating set of your arithmetic group, you can define the Cayley graphs associated to the finite group GZ mod Q and SQ, which is S modulo Q. 
And as before, song approximation is equivalent to connectivity. And therefore, it's natural to state the super storm approximation properties, the property that these Cayley graphs are expanders. And this is, in fact, true, and it is a theorem. And this super strong approximation property for arithmetic groups uh, was, it's, uh, it's a more common name is called property tau. It's a property suggested by uh, Alex Lubotsky, which is, as the name suggests, it's kind of a, uh, it's the love child of Kashdan property T and the Selberg 316 theorem extended to other arithmetic groups. And there is also a second proof, which is the, the generalization of the bourguin gambert expansion method. I should say that the bourguin gambert expansion method is stronger in some sense and, and slightly weaker in another sense. It's stronger because it applies for a much larger class of groups, not just arithmetic groups, but also for thin groups. It proves the expansion property. And it's slightly weaker because as far as I'm aware, unless somebody in the audience will correct me, it's all, today it's only known when Q is square well free. But other than that, it, this is, a, so we have two completely different proofs for this uh, super strong approximation. And exactly as before, the super strong approximation, the expansion gives us a logarithmic diameter, which will result, by the way, in a, in a bound on the covering exponent, but I won't, I won't talk about the covering exponent anymore in this talk. Um, okay, so the super strong approximation is true also. What about the optimal strong approximation? So the same definition from before just, uh, yeah, okay, uh, apply in this setting as well. You need to fix some norm, maybe the Euclidean norm if you embed your, if your group is linear. And the exponent, the ratio three over two is now replaced by this uh, normalization constant alpha. And you define exactly the same thing. You define the individual covering exponent of uh, element in the final group. G and GQ and kappa mu of Q is the average among all the elements in the final group and kappa mu is the lean soup uh, when Q grows to infinity and by the pigeonhole principle and the normalization with alpha, we get that kappa mu cannot go below one. And the conjecture, the conjecture properties that uh, our, th these arithmetic groups have the optimal strong approximation, meaning that they could be lifted, uh, any, almost any element in the finite group can be lifted uh, in a very efficient way. Efficient in terms of size, not uh, algorithmic. Uh, okay, so now I have some uh, uh, fresh uh, uh, out of the press uh, news. Uh, I received this preprint uh, a few days ago uh, that if, uh, two combining two works, the first one by Asin and Bloomer, and later on uh, Jana and Camber, who remove an hypothesis in Asin and Bloomer's paper. This optimal strong approximation result now holds uh, unconditionally for any special linear groups, assuming the Q of square three. Uh, at this point in time, it's uh, it's I I want to add that. The way to, that Sarnak proved his strong optimal strong approximation for SL2 was by appealing to a density uh, theorem, uh, the density version of the Stelberg Ramanujan conjecture. And this is exactly what Assing and Blumer, and together with uh, Jana and Kamber, uh, get. They get a density theorem that enables them to prove the optimal strong approximation. And no other group is known to satisfy the optimal strong approximation as of now. Okay, so and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on the second case. And the case where the group is uh, compact at infinity and our lattice is the P arithmetic lattice. And, and I'm going to show you that uh, in, in a parallel field, 
uh, people working on expanded graphs and Nugent complexes, they have also discovered a property, which is an optimal property, which is equivalent to the optimal sum approximation. And to describe this property, I want to kind of switch the object that we're looking at. Instead of looking at the Cayley graphs, which are a bit unnatural because they depend on this auxiliary generating set S, there is a more natural complex associated to our, to these uh, modulo Q homomorphisms. So what you can do is you can take the, what it's building of the Fiade group and you can quotient it by the congruent subgroup. And this, this, uh, these are finite simplicial complexes, finite arithmetic complexes, um, analog, these are periodic analog of uh, locally symmetric spaces obtained by quotienting by congruent subgroups like modular curves. And they actually have a high dimensional, non-trivial high dimensional structure. They, they come, they have vertices, edges, triangles, and so on. So to make this talk more concrete, I'm going to look, I'm going to associate to them certain directed graphs. I'm going to just to look at the maximal faces of these complexes, this uh, curly X of Q, which can be identified with the double coset divided from the right by an Ivahori subgroup I, which is a stabilizer of the maximal phase, and divided from the left by the congruent subgroup gamma Q. And this would be the set of vertices of our graphs. And we have some freedom of how to choose the adjacency operator, and hence the adjacency relation. And, and we have a lot of freedom. So for any element in the periodic group, you can define an adjacency operator to be the ivahori Eke operator acting by convolution from the right uh, by the double ivahori coset IAI. So these are natural geometric operators. They are defined on the building and they descend to all the finite portions of the buildings. Um, clearly, th there is some uh, a lot of redundant uh, information if I allow you to run over all elements in the periodic group. So let me restrict attention to a specific elements. First of all, recall that there is a affine broad decomposition that enables you to write every element in the periodic group is in the following form. So the double coset, the, the, the representative of the double coset actually belong to the, uh, to, could be written as a product of a, some torsion element and some free element, an element in the vial chamber, to those of you who know what it is. Um, I don't want to handle the torsion elements, the, the elements coming in. I don't want to have anything coming from the finite veil group because they make the computation uh, much more difficult. And they also, uh, in applications, uh, the, the adjacency operas that, that we want, we want them to have some nice collision-free structure uh, behavior on the building. So I'm going to take element only from the positive veil chamber. Okay, and, and this, these are elements that uh, people working on studying the expanded graphs and high dimensional expanders, uh, they like these operators because these are, the, these are non-backtracking operators. Whenever you walk on the building, you never get back to where you started. You only see new vertices as you progress. Okay, so here is a, here is a definition. It's, it's slightly different definition uh, than the usual definition of Ramanujan complexes. Uh, it's, uh, it is motivated by uh, the work of uh, Lubetsky, Lubotsky and Pazuchewski, which I will uh, describe in a second. And this is, uh, we call these arithmetic complexes Ramanujan if the corresponding directed graph of them are Ramanujan, when are the directed graph of Ramanujan? When the spectrum of the adjacency operator uh, of these graphs is contained in the union of these two sets. The set on the left is usually refers to as a set of trivial eigenvalues. These are the eigenvalues in absolute value equal the degree. For graphs, these are usually the degree and minus the degree. For directed graph, you can have roots of unity times the degree. 
For simplicity, let's assume that the only trivial eigenvalue is the degree and its eigenvector is the constant function. Uh, the second segment uh, could be called the Ramanujan. Uh, it's, sorry, it's not a segment, it's a, uh, it's a ball in the complex plane. Uh, this, is, this is the Ramanujan part of the spectrum. This is the spectrum coming from the, the, the covering directed uh, uh, tree. Uh, this is the part of the spectrum This is, this is the, the good part of the spectrum, so to speak. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the Ramanujan graphs might look at this and be a bit confused because for Ramanujan graphs, you want that the non-trivial eigenvalues to be bounded by two times square root of the degree minus one. But these are for the adjacency operators on the vertices of an undirected Ramanujan graph and here we have a directed Ramanujan graph uh, where the definition is a, a bit more, uh, a bit simpler to remember, just square root of the degree. Okay, so these Ramanujan complexes, um, why, uh, what kind of uh, interesting properties do, do they uh, have? So, Here's what they, here's the interesting property that they satisfy, and here's their connection with the optimal strong approximation result I mentioned earlier. So let's, uh, I'm going to fix A, which defined the adjacency operator, and I'll consider the D graph uh, XQ, where Q goes to infinity. And a simple, uh, okay, so one can now uh, observe that. Uh, if you fix some epsilon and you let Q go to infinity by a simple union bound, if you look at only the vertices in the graph uh, whose distance from some, from the origin is bounded by one minus epsilon times log to the base of the degree of the graph, the side of the graph, then even if at each step you see only new vertices as you progress in the graph, this set is grows smaller than the side of the graph. The optimal almost diameter property is the fact that if you go a little bit over there, over this bound, and then you switch the, min, the minus epsilon to plus epsilon, then you see almost all of the graph. Meaning that the number of vertices whose distance is greater than one plus epsilon times log the side of the graph is negligible. If it was zero, then this would be the diameter. Uh, and we know that this, cannot be, uh, this is, this does not happen because of the big holes phenomenon. So we cannot expect that the right hand side to be zero, but uh, we want it to be negligible. And this, this is what we call the optimal almost diameter. And clearly you can, you can see the, the, the relation between the optimal strong approximation and the optimal almost diameter. The, the, the two properties are strongly related. If you want to be precise and you want to show the equivalence, then you need to just pick the norm using the optimal strong approximation result to be compatible with the distance on these directed graphs. And, and now I can state the a line of results, uh, starting with the breakthrough uh, result of Lubetsky and Perez, who showed that Ramanujan graphs satisfy the optimal almost diameter. This was uh, shown uh, shortly after also by Sardari. And this phenomenon was generalized to Ramanujan complexes by uh, Lubetsky, Lubotsky, and Pardonchevsky, uh, showing that Ramanujan complexes have the optimal almost diameter, which is again, you can think of it as the optimal strong approximation result. Uh, in fact, I should say that the the, a stronger property was proved, uh, namely a cutoff result for random walks. And I should also mention that uh, I'm not stating the best result here because I'm fixing this epsilon, but you can actually ask for a better understanding of the epsilon. And to those of you who know what the cutoff property is, uh, let me just mention that uh, Nasterodi and Sarnak actually proved that for Ramanujan graphs, the cutoff is very good 
the 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 window of the cutoff is of bounded size, and there is a question of whether it's true, generally speaking. In any case, Ramanujan implied the optimal sum approximation. That's what I uh, I hope you remember from this uh, result. Now the, the proof is is very simple. So I I mean I, I've heard that every every talk should contain a, a proof. Uh, it should also contain a joke, but I don't know any joke. Um, so let me show you the the the, the short proof, the, the short sketch of the proof. Um, quite nice. So I'll denote by n the size of the graph and k the degree, and k and x zero is some the origin point. And for any l, uh, s of l will denote the support of the adjacency operator to the power l apply on the indicator function of the vertex. This is exactly the sphere of distance l. Um, from the origin. So on the one hand, a simple union bound show that if L is one minus epsilon times log the size of the graph, then you cover a small fraction of the graph. Uh, what happens if L is one plus epsilon times log the size of the graph? So let's look at the term in the middle. You apply the adjacency operator to the power L on uh, the projection of the indicator functions to the space orthogonal to the constant function. So on the one hand, oh, what, sorry. Okay, so on the one hand, if I were to just, I can lower bound it by looking at the values of this function at points outside of the sphere. Uh, and what I get is that, um, what I get the size of the complement of the sphere times uh, time this uh, quantity, uh, which is n to it's n to the two epsilon. Uh, on the other hand, I can bound uh, this from above by four times the operator norm restricted to the non-trivial part of the spectrum. And well, this is like taking the eigenvalue, the maximal eigenvalue of t to the l square, right? the maximal eigenvalue of t to the a because of the Ramanujan is square root of k. And so now we get uh, that uh, the, from this we get that the complement of the sphere is uh, also negligible. This is the complete sketch of the proof with only one uh, lie. Not a, it's not that it's not true, but uh, th this is not a trivial uh, estimate. It actually uses some representation theory. So maybe I should uh, tell you why this is true. It would have been true if the graph was undirected and the operator were normal, then you can compare directly the norm with the maximal eigenvalue. But the, these operators are not normal, not like the Heckler operators. However, these are Ivahori operators and using the theory of the representation theory of ivahori Hori algebra, one can actually show that these, although they're not normal, they're not unitarily diagonalizable, but they are unitarily equivalent to block diagonal matrices and the blocks are of size, of bounded size. And that's, that's really the, the last piece of the puzzle in this book. Okay. So we've seen that the Ramanujan property implies the optimal song, that, approximation result. And so natural question is, are these complexes, are these arithmetic complexes Ramanujan? If so, we get the optimal sum approximation result for the P arithmetic group. And the answer is that uh, not usually, for example, most matrix groups uh, are not Ramanujan complexes. And the reason is that the naive Ramanujan conjecture breaks down in uh, for most classical matrix group. And the first counter example were constructed by Hauf, Yefteski, Shapiro, but now we understand uh, better the failure of the Ramanujan conjecture. So what do we do uh, since we, we we might not be able to prove the Ramanujan. So as a, so Stalmak and Shui 
uh, anticipating this problem already in the 90s, they suggested uh, a replacement of the Ramanujan property, uh, which says that you don't really need Ramanujan on the nose. It's okay that you have some violation of the Ramanujan conjecture as long as there are, there are few of them. Uh, so, and more explicitly, uh, the sauna shui density hypothesis uh, requires that for any parameter r between two and infinity, uh, and for any q growing to infinity, the number of eigenvalues. Okay, so here there are some black boxes. Eigenvalues correspond to irreducible representation of the Piadi group with Ivahori fixed vector. So there is some representation theory in the background, and these representation have an invariant called rate of decay. This invariant grows when the eigenvalue becomes worse and worse. Um, and so whenever you have eigenvalues which are too large, so the set of eigenvalues which are too large uh, is bounded by this explicit bound, by the total number of uh, vertices in the graph to the power of two over r. Okay, so for, for time consideration, I won't explain the exact formula of how to go from the eigenvalue to the to the r of the eigenvalue. Uh, let me just describe the the extreme cases uh, when the eigenvalue is trivial and r is infinity, and when the eigenvalue is in the Ramanujan domain, then r is two. And note that the, the sound actuate density hypothesis, an easy way to remember it is that it is a linear interpolation between the two exponents when R is two and infinity, you see that for infinity, the left-hand side is of finite size independent of Q. And when R is equal to two, then the bound is trivially true. Okay. Um, so this is the last slide. Um, I want to, I'm, I'm, uh, I want to mention some uh, two ongoing projects that I'm involved. I, I'm, I'm not stating any explicit results. Uh, uh, just mentioning that this, uh, that uh, in both of these projects we have a, a strategy to prove the sound trade density hypothesis. Um, the strategy uses two main tools coming from the Langlands program. The first is uh, the endoscopic classification of automorphic representation for classical groups. This was done by Rogowski completely for the unitary three by three matrices and by Althusser for quasi split classical groups. And there are some uh, follow up uh, improvements uh, for inner forms of classical groups by Taibi and Kaleta and Minges and Chin and White. And the second key result that we need is the generalized Ramanujan Peterson conjecture, which uh, is now a theorem and it's due to a long list of, uh, uh, of uh, famous uh, mathematicians and their works on the Langlands, on the Langlands problem, the Ramanujan conjecture, starting with Eichler, Shimura, Delin, Langlands, Glozel, Shin, uh, and the list goes on and on. I've, I didn't give credit to all the people that contribute to the final theorem that enable that proved the Ramanujan Peterson conjecture. And I'm not even stating the Ramanujan Peterson conjecture explicitly. Um, the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that the, the sound rate density hypothesis can actually be deduced from a combination of the endoscopic classification and the Ramanujan Peterson conjecture and some uh, perhaps other working hypothesis coming from the Langlands program. And in uh, two joint uh, ongoing works, uh, the first one on the on deep definite inner forms of U3, we actually proved their stronger result that the Sarnak Shui density hypothesis. Oh, I forgot to say, this is a joint work with Brooke Fagon and Katrin Morichet and Ori Podnachevsky. We show that for the unitary three by three matrices, not only do we have the sound trade density hypothesis, we actually have Ramanujan complexes, which is surprising, but we, 
we get, and in particular, we get the sum, the, the optimal sum approximation result. And in another uh, ongoing joint work with uh, Matilda gerbeli Gauthier and Henry Gustafsson, which I should apologize to because in the abstract I sent you, there is a U in, in his name, it should be an O. Uh, so in, in that joint work, we are also considering the case of definite inner forms of the orthogonal, five, special orthogonal uh, group on five or five matrices, or if you want, the, the projective symplectic group of four by four matrices. And these are, and this is the, 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 the two results and hopefully uh, the beginning of uh, the understanding of how the Langlands program could deduce the sound natural density hypothesis and eventually gives you also uh, optimal sound approximation, approximation uh, results and uh, optimal almost diameter results for arithmetic complexes. Uh, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much for the invitation.